So, happy anniversary to you, brothers and sisters in Christ and Bread from Heaven Christian Fellowship. And I like to uh, uh, be part of, I, I would like to tell you that I'm blessed to be sharing God's Word tonight. And the title of our message this evening is Unity in Church and Gospel Transformation of Believers, taken from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 to 22, and Ephesians chapter 3, verses 1 to 6 from the ESV. But before we go on with our message this evening, I'd like to invite you to join me in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, uh, totoo nga pong kayo ay faithful to your covenant. Lord, you are faithful principally to your covenant because that's who you are. That is your character and that is your attribute. So Lord, now as we celebrate your faithfulness, we would like to honor you, Lord, uh, through this uh, time as we exposit on what you want us to learn. Lord, uh, still the tongue of, those, of, of the one who speaks. And we pray, Lord, that the hearts of those who will hear will be quickened, Lord, to you. In Jesus' most precious name, and all of us will say, as I said, the title of our message this evening is Unity in Church and Gospel Transformation of Believers. So taken from Ephesians chapter 2 and 3 from the ESV. So if you have your Bibles, please turn with me there. But before we read through the passage, I'd like to begin our message by saying that in our day and age, it cannot be denied, hindi natin magpapakakaila mga kapatid, that uh, Christian churches from far and wide are defined, or Christian churches are held together by different human constituencies or interests. Some churches are held together by their commitment to youth programs. Is Bread from Heaven committed to youth programs? Of course, we are. But some churches are distinctively held together by their commitment to youth programs. Some churches are, are held by their commitment to social concerns. Justice issues here, human rights issues there. Some churches are driven by missions. So some churches uh, invest a lot of money so that they will have missionaries to be sent in uh, different parts of the world to share the gospel. There are churches that are held together along ethnic or racial lines. Diba sa atin sa Philippines, we have Korean churches, we have Chinese churches, we have uh, churches, uh, Japanese churches, etc., etc. There are churches which are held together by different human interests, but my question, mga kapatid, is are these interests the real glue that should bind believers and churches together? Katingin niya. Are these special interests the glue or the seal or the thing that should bind or unite Christian churches together? Mga kapatid, I would submit to you this evening that the answer to that is no. It is not. Human interest should never be the thing that binds Christian churches together. There must be something more if the church is to, supposed to be the faithful bride of Christ. Diba? Remember, we are, as a church, the bride of Christ. The church at large is supposed to be the bride of Christ. The local church which makes up the church at large forms uh, the, is an extension of the, the, bride of, of the bride of Christ. So I would submit to you, mga kapatid, that if the church is the bride of Christ, the bride's preoccupation should be what? To reflect the glory of the groom. Di ba? The bride's preoccupation should be to reflect the glory of the groom and it is best achieved by her being transformed into how the groom is like. In other words, if the church was the bride of Christ, it should reflect Christ-likeness. And Christ-likeness will only happen in churches if individual believers in churches are transformed by the gospel. So lahat tayo, para tayo isang maging kalugod-lugod at faithful na bride of Christ. Each and every one of us here in Bread from Heaven would have to be transformed by the gospel. And gospel transformation, mga kapatid, is what unites or holds the church together. So, if you have your Bibles with you, kindly uh, read with me or you can just look at the, at the screen right there. And uh, we begin in Ephesians chapter 2 from verse 11 where it says, Therefore, remember that at one time... 
you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision. Sino yun? Sino yung uncircumcision? Gentiles. Sino yung, un sino yung uncircumcision? Gentiles. Sino yung circumcision? The Jews. Therefore, at one, at one time, you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands, remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope with, and without God in the world. So, if there is an issue here, if there is a dilemma here, if there is big trouble here, sino ang may malaking problema? It is the Gentiles. Why so? Because they were alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Ayan, sabi ni Paul, verse 13. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by what? By the blood of of Christ. Verse 14. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace and might reconcile us both, Jew and Gentile, to God in one body, through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. In other words, the message of peace or the, uh, the, uh, the consequences of justification, which I will explain to you later, became av available both to the Jew who is near and to the Gentile who is far off. Verse 18. For through him, we have both access in one spirit to the Father. So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In Him, you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Let's move to Ephesians chapter 3, verses 1 to 6, where it says, Verse 1, For this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I have written briefly, when you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Meaning to say, even the Jews of old didn't know about this. And this, is, this mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and part partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through how? Through the gospel. May the Lord add his blessings upon the reading of his word, and all of us will say. Let me put this in Ephesians chapter 2. It reflects an issue which all local churches face. Time, time and time again, or quite frequently, all local churches would experience at one point in their history issues concerning unity. Now, in the Ephesian church, as well as all other first century churches where the Apostle Paul was part of, you would find that there are two groups of people that are almost always at each other's throats. Sino ito? These are the Jewish Christians and these are the Gentile Christians. Now, why is this so? Now, to the Jews, you cannot even be seen fellowshipping with a non-Jew. If you were a Jew, it is not considered kosher for you to be in the house of a Jew. Why? 
uh, sorry, of a non-Jew because non-Jews were considered unclean. If you shook the hand, if you as a man shook the hand of a non-Jew, that would be like eating pork. Para kang para kumakain ng mga lechon, di ba? So mahilig kayo sa lechon. So so it's just like eating lechon. So just imagine you shaking the hand of someone who you knew to be unclean. So to the Jew, that is who a Gentile was. Now, to the Gentile, ang tingin nila sa mga Jew ay ano? These Jews are just people from one of our backwater colonies. They are underdeveloped. They believe in one God. They are superstitious. They have all of these laws. They have these complex dietary dietary uh, requirements. Kailangan hindi magkasama ang milk at saka karne. Kailangan magkahiwalay ng lagayan nito. Kailangan mag- they, they have all of these holidays and they are superstitious and they do not use logic. They're inferior to us. They're a backwater poor uh, poor people with no military might and no influence whatsoever. It's just that they make a lot of noise. Now, ang nangyari, some of these Jews and some of these Gentiles became converted. The Lord changed them, the Lord regenerated them, and they were now brought as one people. In other words, if there were two groups of people in the first century na hindi mo pwede pagsamahin sa isang kwarto, it is the Jew and the Gentile. This was an issue. So unity was an issue in the church of Ephesus as in other local church or local churches during Paul's time. Now, so as I was saying, the Jews and the Jews and the non-Jewish believers, what? They despised each other. And this spilled over even when they were Christians already. There were some talk of the, the church leadership preferring non-Jews to, to Jews. There was talk of some of these Jews introducing some of their Old Testament customs and rituals in the church which should not be so. There was an issue here. So what I'm trying to say here is, if there was ever an issue that perplexed the church at that time, which was an existential threat to the first century churches, it was issues that pertain to unity. So unity ang naging issue nila in the first century. Now, mga kapatid, I would like to make this statement. Our unity as believers should not be defined by race, social status, any interest whatsoever or human construct. But instead, I would like to submit to you our main transition statement, which is this. What unites a local church together is what? The gospel transformation of all its believers. Read that with me right now. One, two, ready, read. What unites a local church together is the gospel transformation of all its believers. Now, I think gospel transformation. So let's define it. Gospel transformation simply means how much a believer has been transformed. It is that which, uh, it is the degree to which a believer has been transformed by the gospel in thought and in action, so that whenever he or she faces a situation where a decision has to be made, the thoughts and actions that follow glorify God alone. Litin natin ha, ang gospel transformation is the degree by which a believer has been changed by the gospel in thought and in action so that whenever he or she faces a situation, the thoughts and actions that follow glorify God alone. Ibig sabihin, this believer knows that he or she is a sinner. This believer knows that uh, he, he, he or she deserves death because she is a sinner. This believer knows that Jesus Christ is the only way and Jesus Christ is the only person who was able to rectify or pay for, for his sins. Why so? Because he was both God and man. And if he submits to faith in Jesus Christ, surrenders his life to Jesus Christ, therefore, he will have an eternity with God. So, this is what the gospel is. Now, with that simple message, gospel transformation is the degree by how much you and I are affected by it. Have we been transformed? Have we been made worse? Have we been 
Uh, have we been uh, naging mas maigi ba tayong anak? Naging mas maigi ba tayong asawa? Etc. Etc. So that when we face a situation in that particular context by which we are in, all our thoughts and our actions that would follow as a result of gospel transformation would be glorifying to God. So, on our side of things, tanong muna natin ito mga question na ito. On our side of things, napag-usapan natin, believer, di ba? So, on our side of things, what makes a true believer? Review lang po ito, mga kapatid. On our side of things, the things that make a true believer are the following. First, proof of conversion. So, at ito yung nakikita natin, di ba? Ito yung nakikita natin. Hindi natin nakikita yung pagiging born again or your regeneration because it's the act of the Holy Spirit. That's something that we cannot see. So, what we can see from our end of things is first, proof of conversion. At one time in our lives, we have been, after the Lord has changed our hearts, our discernment, and our thoughts, and our, and, and, and our decision making, we surrendered our lives to Jesus Christ. This is the time when we were converted. Second, proof of a changed life. So after conversion, the things that we may see is nagbago yung tao. There was a change in the behavior of the person. That which caused him to be converted has changed the way he lives. Dati, pasagulero yung tao, mainit ang ulo, uh, barumbado, etc. But now, you have a person who is very respectful, very, very, very considerate, etc., etc. And finally, the last proof is this. The last proof of, of, of what makes a true believer is perseverance in Christ-likeness even until death. These are the things that we see. But in as far as us, our message is concerned about unity today, we will be touching mostly on two things. Conversion and yung changed life. Kasi wala pa nakakarating sa atin dun sa Christ-likeness even until death kasi otherwise we won't be in this room, right? So yun yung, yun yung ating pag-uusapan this evening. So, so this leads us, the main transition statement should beg this question. Sabi natin, what defines our unity is gospel transformation. So therefore, from that particular thesis, we should be able to ask a transition question, which is this. How does being transformed by the gospel unite all believers in the local church? Papano? How does being transformed by the gospel unite all believers in the local church? First, gospel transformed believers appreciate that it took the sacrifice of one Savior to reconcile all of God's people to Him as one body. Ulitin ka po ha. Ang, pagiging, ang, ang, ang gospel transformation the degree by which the gospel has transformed us should cause us to appreciate that it took the sacrifice, sacrifice, precious sacrifice of one Savior to reconcile all of us, God's people, to Him as one body. Reading from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 14 to 16, which says, For He Himself, Jesus Christ, is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in His flesh the dividing wall of hostility between us and between abolishing, uh, uh, abolishing the law of the commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of two. So wala nang Jew at wala nang Gentile. There is no longer any Jew nor Greek. Ito ibig sabihin no. There is no, uh, so making peace and might reconcile us both to God in one body. How? Through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. So it took a sacrifice for us to be truly united and held together. And this is the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. So what is the meaning of Ephesians chapter 2 verses 14 and 16? Because, sabi nga ni Pastor Doy, if you throw a text, you should be able to explain the meaning of the text. So, ethos or the verse. The Jews were hostile to the Gentiles because, as I said, they were considered unclean and beyond hope for salvation. Why? Because the Gentiles did not have the law. And the people who were the custodians of the law were the Jews. Ang paniwala ng mga Hudyo is that if you obey the law, you are saved. 
But if you, if you do not have any knowledge of the law, if, you, if, if these people do not even hear about the law, how can they be saved? Tama, di ba? Yun ang kanilang logic. So, they believed that the Gentiles were unclean and beyond hope for salvation because the Gentiles did not have the law. Now, Jesus Christ, what did Jesus Christ do? Jesus Christ destroyed the curse that came with believing that obedience to the law brought salvation. How? By obeying the law perfectly. His perfect record of obedience destroyed the, the curse that came with believing that obedience to the law brought salvation. Ano yung curse of the law? If you believe the law, and if that is what you believe, this is how you believe salvation comes, but if you actually miss any of the, any of the laws, what? What does that mean? You have failed the entire thing. And failing the entire thing meant what? Capital punishment. As far as God is concerned, the penalty for missing even a, a, an aspect of the law meant eternal death. So question, do we as people every day miss the law if we were to follow that? The answer is yes. So Jesus Christ destroyed the curse of the law that came with believing that obedience to the law brought salvation by obeying the law. And in doing so, having destroyed the law, even those who had no access to the law, such as the Gentiles, can be reconciled to God because of Christ's obedience and death. Atonement paid, record of obedience secured, imputed to you for righteousness. You and I. So, yun po ang ginawa ni Jesus Christ. Now, how do we apply Ephesians chapter 2, verses 14 and 16? Ito po. All believers contributed nothing to their salvation. And thus, no believer should have any reason to think of himself or herself as better than anybody else, especially in church. All believers contributed nothing to, our, to, to their salvation and thus none of us should have any reason to think that we are better or more righteous than anybody else. And since believers have no reason to feel self-righteous, then humility and gratitude should be the distinctive character of all believers who are part of a local church. Mahirap ito. Humility and gratitude means more and more of yourself is mortified. Meaning to say, there should be less and less of ourselves. Entitlement should be a thing of the past, but we wrestle with it every day. Minsan nagpipreach tayo ng entitlement dito. Tapos galit na galit tayo pagka, bakit ang traffic-traffic? Ang bagal-bagal magmaneho. Hindi ba marunong magmaneho yung taong nasa? I own the road. I have a meeting. I should be preaching in church. But this person in front of me is so slow. I tell me, I should be preaching about God's grace and humility and gratitude. But this person in front of me is so slow. Bagal. Dapat magtumabi na lang siya because people like me who have an urgent, uh, an urgent calling from the Lord should be on time in church. Wow. Very good. Very good, no? This is how easy it is to be humble and grateful. This is how easy it is to acquire humility and gratitude because we should not be self-righteous. That's how easy it is. You can be preaching this one thing and you can be violating the same thing that you preach the second after. Ang hirap, no? Now, yung po ang ating first. No? The first. The first way by which gospel transformation uh, will unite us is this. Gospel transformed believers appreciate that it took the sacrifice of one Savior to reconcile all of God's people to Him as one body. So, Sister Cora, yung palang 20 minutes na yon. So, you were asking me to limit the message to 20 minutes, so hindi pwede, no? Kasi, yan. Now, second, gospel transformed believers appreciate that since we have been reconciled with God through Christ, we are now at peace with God. Therefore, believers should be at peace with one another. Ulitin ka po, ha? Gospel transformed believers appreciate the fact that since we have been reconciled with God, ano sabi ni Paul in Romans 5? Sabi ni Paul, now you, you have what? Peace with God. So, so we have now, we have been reconciled with God, we are now at peace with Him. And therefore, if we are at peace with God, we should also be at peace 
with other people who are at peace with Him. So, dapat we should be at peace with one another. Reading to you from Ephesians chapter 2, the, first, the, the same verses include uh, verse 17 where it says, For He Himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in His flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that He might create in Himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. So mga kapatid, we should be at peace with one another. Now, of course, the meaning is rather self-explanatory. Now, if you, if you talk about the meaning of this, of, of this particular passage, when Christ reconciled us with the Father, the reason, this is the reason why he is able to say to all of them, Peace be with you. Now, now, when was the, the first time that Jesus Christ said, Peace be to you? Kailan? Uh, during his, after his resurrection. Bakit? Tapos na yung justification eh. You are now at peace with God. That's why he was saying, Peace be with you. May ibig sabihin nun. Yun ang ibig sabihin. Not just because they were afraid that they thought they saw a ghost. But they were, he was actually saying to him, to them, peace be with you because the peace that, that you, there is now the peace because I have completed the work, I have, you are justified, you now have peace with God. So peace, may the peace of God stay with you. That's what it means. No? So, so shalom, yun ang ibig sabihin nun, nasa, ano, pero ibang ibig sabihin na shalom sa Old Testament. Now, since we have been forgiven, God no longer sees us as His enemy. So we obviously have peace with Him. So if we have peace with God, all true believers should, should make every effort to be at peace with one another. Yung take should be made there. No? If we have peace with God, all true believers should make every effort to be at peace with one another. So, question mga kapatid. Mahirap ba to be at peace with one another? Mahirap siguro dahil sabi ni Paul, be at peace with one another hanggat kaya ninyo. There's, a, there's one passage that says, for as long as it is possible for you to do it, be at peace with one another. But it doesn't change the fact that even if a person does not want to have peace with you, you should be actually willing to make peace with the person. So it's difficult. It is difficult. So it requires a degree of gospel transformation for us to be able to be at peace with one another. So, how do we apply Ephesians chapter 2, verses 14 to 17? Application would, would just simply point to the fact that any differences that we have with other brothers and, uh, brothers and uh, sisters in Christ can be resolved if we go back and remind ourselves of how Christ secured our peace with God. What did it take? What did it take for us to have peace with God? It took a death and it took a sacrifice. That's what it took. It took a death. It took the death and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. So let's go back to that. If for instance, hindi natin marisul ba? Alimbawa, meron tayong, meron tayong mga disputes among ourselves. Uh, let's, let's first do that. Let's remind ourselves of how Jesus Christ secured our peace with God. And if, if we do that, the pain of any offense done to us by other believers can be surmounted if we appreciate that God not only forgave us, but He also extended His grace to us in the person of Christ while we were still sinners then, and even extends His grace to us now even if we sin. Tingnan niyo po ha, God did two things. He extended His grace to us while we were yet sinners. What did He do? He allowed Jesus Christ to die for us. Why? We, while we were still sinners. Now, we still sin. Right? Tama. True or false? We still sin. Does God extend His grace to us? The answer is yes. And the reason for God extending His grace to us, because he, God extends His grace to us because we are at peace with Him now. And what He sees is not the old self. And what He sees is who? Jesus Christ. So that's the reason why. So, in other words, we must apply the fact that since we have been given peace with, by God, we should be able to give peace. We should be able to live at peace 
with one another as well. So, gospel transformed believers appreciate that since we have been reconciled with God through Christ, we are now at peace with God. Therefore, believers should be at peace with one another. Finally, gospel transformed believers appreciate that since we have been reconciled with God through Christ, our value before God as individual believers is the same. Pare pareho po ang tingin na Panginoon sa atin. The dignity that we have, the dignity that was given to us by God is the same. Gospel, babasahin ko po. Sige, basahin natin pare-pareho. Let's read together. One, two, three. Gospel transformed believers appreciate that since we have been reconciled with God through Christ, our value before God as individual believers is the same. Pare-pareho lang po. Reading from two verses. I'll read the first one. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 22, where it says, In Him, you are also being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. That's rather self-explanatory, di po ba? One of, the, one of the things that give us value is the fact that we are God's dwelling place. If we were sinful, if, we were, if, we, if, if sin has not been removed from us by Jesus Christ, He will not dwell in us. But the mere fact that our righteousness has been given by Christ, God now freely dwells in us. And that means it is our privilege to have God dwell in us, and this is evidenced by our love for Him and His Word, and our hatred for sin. Diba every day? We should be hateful of our sin, and we should love the Word of God more. This is the reason why when we sin, we feel bad. But this is also the reason why even after feeling God and we come to the throne of God for grace because we sin, we feel good. Because alam natin yun, no? Because God dwells in us and we can appropriate the grace that this promise carries. And of course, in Ephesians 3 verse 6 where it says, This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Jesus Christ through the gospel. So, how do you apply this? Again, that's rather self-explanatory. God values us to allow us access to the benefits of being part of His covenant people, which include both temporal, temporal blessings, such as spiritual and pastoral care, and eternal blessings, of course, that goes without saying, that's eternal life, being, uh, uh, having eternal life in the presence of God. So, let's summarize. How does being transformed by the gospel unite all believers in the local church? Do you agree that unity is still an issue in all churches? It is, right? Because there are as many temperaments and ideas as there are, me the, uh, uh, as, as there are many members in church. So unity is almost always like what they call in military parlance as a powder keg. You know what a powder keg is? You light it, delicado baka magsumiklap. And it is always an issue because we have different temperaments. We're simply different individuals. And unity should always be uh, a goal, unity in Christ. So how does being transformed by the gospel unite all believers in the local church? How does being transformed by the gospel unite the believers in the local church? First, let's read together. Gospel transformed believers appreciate that it took the sacrifice of one Savior to reconcile all of God's people to Him as one body. Second, gospel transformed believers appreciate that since we have been reconciled with God through Christ, we are now at peace with God. Therefore, believers should be at peace with one another. Finally, gospel transformed believers appreciate that since we have been reconciled with God through Jesus Christ, our value before God as individuals, individual believers is the same. We are celebrating more than three decades as a church united under God through Jesus Christ. Let's thank God and let's pray that every day our, our road to sanctification and gospel transformation will be a priority for, for us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for your faithfulness and for your daily grace that allows us to be transformed by your gospel. We thank you, Lord, for uh, despite our weaknesses, your gospel is potent and it truly is, uh, as is your word, 
a double-edged sword that pierces our hearts. So Lord, allow us to, as we surrender more of ourselves every day to you, to be like the faithful uh, bride of Christ, whose prime preoccupation is the glory of her groom. May we, may we be found faithful. In Jesus Christ's most precious name, and all of us will say, Amen.